Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to name this study more than anything. It's a cur this, this is going to be an encouragement to the body of Christ, but kind of naming around uh, all these people are around you, yet still so lonely. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to start this with 2 Timothy 4.16. Turn to 2 Timothy 4.16. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Is that right? I'm in 1 Timothy. Excuse me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. That looks better. It says here, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, a man in ministry. At first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Okay. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. 17, this is for us, for this study. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Okay? But this is Christ, no matter what, when you feel like you're just so alone, remember, you're never alone. Grab this book and start reading it. Okay? Uh, start singing a hymn. Start talking to the Lord about Bible, the you know Bible doctrines, instruction, and righteousness. Okay. Start praying. Start praying for the brethren. Okay. Take a walk. Start talking with the Lord. You may you need to have a strong prayer life. If you have a strong prayer life, uh, there's still gonna be times you feel you're alone. But all you do is start talking to the Lord, and the next thing you know, that feeling's gone. I mean, physically you're alone. But you don't feel alone anymore, okay? Now, that being said, brothers and Christ, what I'm going to be talking about here is the need for fellowship, okay? We're going to talk about the need for face-to-face -face fellowship. We've kind of gotten away from that. There's men in ministry that have, have really done a 180 on us. And one minute, yeah, fellowship is great. It's not a requirement. But fellowship is great. It's great. And now their whole attitude is, is they want us to be separate and hide out, you know? They don't want us coming together. I mean, their actions say they don't want us coming together in fellowship. What happened? People have gotten so used to being alone physically. And I think one of the causes of this is the internet. I'm pointing over here at my computer. A lot of people like to be internet Christians. They don't want to be Christians in real life. They just they like to play a Christian on the internet. They think this right here, you can have good fellowship on the internet. No, 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 you can't. Okay, and I'm going to prove this through the scriptures. Okay, you can talk with some brethren. No, don't get me wrong. I take it back. If I, I Skype brethren, I used to Skype brethren two to four times a week. Two, I mean, sorry, yeah, two to four times a week, two to four brethren a week, and Skype them and talk with them for an hour, and it was great fellowship. You can Skype someone in, in the video chat. I'd rather be there face to face. I really do. I'd rather have them sitting out here on the deck with me, and we'd have some tea, hot tea, because it's winter time. Uh, we'd have some hot tea, and we'd sit there, and we'd talk about the world. We'd talk about the Word of God. We'd talk about our walk with the Lord. We'd talk about our faults, our struggles, okay, holding each other accountable to this book, correction. Uh, that's true fellowship. I'd rather have be here versus out here, I'm pointing out here on the deck, out the window, versus on the computer. But can you have some fellowship when you're Skyping people? Yeah, I, I, that, that's... That's, that's okay. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying letters aren't. But letters aren't fellowship. Okay? Letters is you. It's a one-way conversation. It's not fellowship. Okay? Letters are always a one-way. And we're going to talk about Paul here in a bit, towards the end. We're going to talk about Paul's attitude. Was he okay with letters? Was he okay with... Let's, let's do the equivalent of today. Was he okay with emails? Was he okay with writing letters? Is he okay with videos that are just one way? Men hiding behind the camera so they don't have to actually deal with brethren face to face? Is he okay with that? We're going to get into that, okay? But the main point of this the study is letting you know that I understand how you feel, okay? Paul felt, there was times where Paul was alone. He felt alone. But then he had to correct himself and say, hey, but God is with me. The Lord is with me. I'm not alone. How many of you have done that, brothers and Christ? You're talking, you're like, man, Lord, I'm just so alone. I'm just, it's just so lonely. And, and 
man, I wish I had had some place to meet up with some brethren and do things with brethren. You know, do simple things with brethren. Build a fence with the brethren. Help a brother work on his car. To be in the, the company of saved sinners. All it seems I'm surrounded by, I'm surrounded by lost sinners. Just all these people around me, yet I'm so alone. I don't fit in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You shouldn't fit in. I don't fit in. And then you get to yourself and you go, wait a minute, I've been praying to the Lord, talking to the Lord. I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. How many of you have done that, brothers and sisters Christ? <laughs> I'm not, I do that a lot. I start, I start getting sorrowful and I start getting lonely and God's like, go for a walk. Talk with me. Tell me about it. Okay? That's good. Okay, in these last days, that's, that's what we have to do a lot in these last days. But I'm going to push and really push again and plead with you, brothers and Christ, the need for house churches. Okay, the need for house churches. I go to town and I, after about five, ten minutes, I'm ready to come home. Why is that? Do you have that feeling too, brothers and Christ? If you don't, in these last days, if you don't, something's not right with you. Your heart's not right with the Lord. I go to town, I can get away with walking on the beach by myself for an hour or two. I go to the farmer's market and spend like 10 minutes there getting what I need. Uh, when I go shopping, I grab what I need and I get out. Um, I leave gospel tracts. If I hit up someone that I know or someone hits me up and a door opens up, I say, oh, hey, can I give you this gospel track? And I'll verbally talk to them and give them a gospel track. But for the most part, when I pull up in my driveway, don't you, you ever have that feeling of, <sighs> finally. You know what that is for me? That's because if you're done right, brother, sis, Christ, if you've done right, and you've made your home, this is the foundation of your home, and you've made your home a Bible-believing, God-fearing home, this is your sanctuary. This is your abstain from all appearance of evil, free zone. I call it a zone. When I come pulling up in the driveway, I'm like, I don't have to put up with the wicked world. All that wickedness before my eyes. I've made this home a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. I pray you've made your home a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. You come to it and you go, oh. but how many of you, you come home and it's Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, satanic style music, just wickedness here, just as much as there's wickednesses out there, which is why when you go to town, you don't have that feeling of, eh, eh. you just go, oh, this is how it is at my house, no big deal. Is that you, brothers and sisters in Christ? Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. A word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You need to get in this book and know this book like you should know this book. Hide it in your heart and you better make your home a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. Get all that wickedness out. And if you can get all that wickedness out, go three, four, five months with your home being clean, staying from all appearance of evil, free home. And when you go to town, you're going to be like, Egh. every time you go to town, Egh. Why? Because that's how wicked this world is. There was a time in the past where you could go to town and good morals, women were, were dresses, modest dresses, long hair, they, you know, they behaved like women, they were kind of in the boundary, not all always, but kind of in the boundary that the God set for women, but they, the world t says it's good morals. But today, everything went out the window. Everything's out the window. Not just with women, but with the men too. Everything's out the window. You go back less than a hundred years ago, everything has just gone crazy in the world. Just wickedness, wickedness, wickedness. You go out there, you're going to be like, Ew, I haven't seen that in a few months. Oh Lord, it sticks out. And you're just like, but you got all these people around you. I've got lost pe uh, neighbors all around me. I go to town, I have lost people all around me. But why do I still feel so lonely? Well, what was Paul's attitude? What was Paul's attitude? We're going to go through this pretty quick. People all around, but still lonely. People all around, but still lonely. 2 Corinthians 6.14. Turn to 2 Corinthians. What was Paul's attitude? Was Paul okay with emails? I know there wasn't emails back there, but he wrote letters. Is he okay with emails? And if he could make a video, would he be okay with just sitting behind the camera and just... This is my ministry, just camera. That's my full ministry right here, camera. Would he be okay with that? I'm going to tell you, I'll give you a heads up. No! 
He's not okay with that. Let's look at this. Corinthians. One of the things, uh, hopefully I got this in here, but one of the things with Corinthians is, is when he wanted to correct Corinthians, he wanted to be there face to face to correct them. You know, we got a lot of cowards nowadays that, that have no problem correcting someone behind a camera. They have no problem writing an email that's one way. Well, this, this is an email from a sister in Christ we'll be reading here, and I'm going to try to answer it for her as best I can. You know, she wants the scripture, but the best I can. But is he okay with, you know, you can correct someone through an email? No, he wanted to be there. He did write a letter to correct them. That's, why how, that's how we got Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians. He's writing to saved sinners at Corinth, not Gentiles at Corinth. Saved sinners at Corinth. There was Jews and Gentiles, okay, that are saved. We're all one in Christ Jesus. But in that letter, his desire was to be there face to face to correct them face to face. Because that's how it's supposed to be. But we got a lot of cowards today that hide behind the camera. You got a lot of cowards today that think they can just write a quick letter so they don't have to get they don't have to hear anything in return. It's just one way. Alright. Just wanted to throw that out there real quick. So when there's correction that needed to be done, Paul wanted to be there face to face. I don't have this in my notes, but remember Paul uh, and Peter. Peter was doing something that was so wrong, he was treating those Gentiles as if they were lost. Okay, He was sinning against the gospel. And it was so serious that Paul said, I had to withstand him to his face. It was face to face. He didn't write a letter. Oh, I'm just going to write a letter to Peter. Oh, Peter, please stop doing that. No, 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 no. no he withstood him to his face. True love for a brother or sister in Christ is dealing with them face to face. Whether it's Skyping, whether it's going to see them, if you have to travel a couple hours. But I'm saying, when you have a problem with a brother and sister in Christ, true love for them is going and talking to them and dealing with them face to face. Not hiding behind the camera. Okay. Not hiding behind an email. Hiding behind a letter. Okay. If you got a problem with the brother in Christ, go talk to him face to face. Paul's desire was. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14. That's one thing I forgot before we get into this. About the lost world. Why do we feel that way? I, I missed a point. Please, I'm going to backpedal a little bit. I missed a point. That's important. Why should you feel like you're all alone when it comes to this lost world? But you're not alone. Remember, Jesus Christ is with you. The Holy Spirit's in you. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you, because the Holy Spirit's connected to Jesus Christ, you have Jesus Christ in you. All right? But why do we feel lonely? 2 Corinthians 6.14 Remember, this is carnal Christians. No, this is, this is people that are getting into the flesh to the point that Paul doubts their salvation. 2 Corinthians 6.14, this is people that are allowing lost people to come in and have a profession of faith, but no fruits. They haven't been proved. We're going to be doing a study coming up about how to prove if someone's a Christian, if someone is truly in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? Please, please, do not deny being a Christian because the lost world perverts the word Christian. We don't, need to be go, do, we don't need to be succeeding to the world and giving the world what they want. The Bible uses Christian. Paul was called a Christian, and he didn't deny it. And he wished that everybody else would be Christians like he is. But like he is, truly saved and born again. All right. Be careful about that. 2 Corinthians 6.14, But he had lost people coming in and hanging out with the saved, and what was happening? Who was influencing who? Was the lost influencing the saved, or was the saved influencing the lost? I've got a picture. If I can find it, I'll put it up here. But um, I had a picture of two guys that look worldly, and one says the world on a shirt, I think it is, and the other one says Christian on the shirt. And below it, it says who's influencing who. They look the same. I'm telling you right now, when you allow lost people in to your fellowship, they are going to influence you. They are going to mess up saved brethren. First and Second Corinthians is a good example of that. 
How would he know that? Because Paul hits him up with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. If this wasn't going on, why warn him? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be not ye, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Yeah. You're not going to feel at home with lost people anymore. You're just, I talk to my family. Now I've gotten to the point where I talk to my family to see how they're doing. But we don't talk about much because they want to talk about worldly things. I'm not into the, the worldly sinful things. I've given them up. I told you this once in one of my testimonies. I used to be a, my, my mother's movie buddy. But when I got saved and gave up all the Hollywood movies, now all she wants to talk about is movies. And I got to the point where I told her, I don't want to hear it. I gave that garbage up for the Lord. And this is a woman who claims to be a Christian. Who claims to be in Christ, but if you were to prove her according to the Word of God, she fails miserably. She's not saved. She's not saved at all. But we hardly talk, just, how you doing, how you doing? Our conversations, when I was lost, we used to talk on the phone for half an hour to an hour. Now our phone conversations are like five minutes. What's the difference? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communication hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? See, these Babel buildings don't get it. When you invite the lost world in, you're inviting Satan in. What concord hath Christ with Belial? You're letting Satan come in, and who's going to be influencing who? The lost is always going to win, influencing and messing up the Christians. Every time. But what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Someone who does, infidel is someone who doesn't believe. Who rejects absolute truth. Who rejects, I say the real Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ in the King James Bible. Now real quick, I had a brother in Christ say something that's very important, and it's true. We do need to be saying the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with saying my Lord and Savior. But when it comes to the world, we need to be definitive in saying the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one. Those others are fakes and frauds. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ, and he can be found in the King James Bible for English-speaking people, God's perfect written word. I pray that's what you're using right now. If you don't have one, get one. If you need one and you can't afford one, email this ministry. I give out Bibles all the time. King James Bibles. Not any Bible, but King James Bible. I burn Bible perversions all the time. <laughs> I do. All right. But I'll give out King James Bibles. I'll get you a good King James Bible. Mm -hmm. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Remember, your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost, and it's supposed to be without blemish. The Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Why? Because your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. Anytime you go out there to have to do your grocery shopping, you should be looking at everything and go, man, these people need Jesus Christ. And I do. And like I said, when a door opens, preach Jesus Christ. Preach the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. Preach against sin. Preach on heaven and hell. Get people saved. When doors open, you open, but you're out there and you're like, these people reject Jesus Christ and they're desperately wicked. They desperately need Jesus Christ. They're on their way to hell. They don't want Jesus Christ. Sometimes I look, when I walk out there, I look at them and go, that used to be me. I, I don't ever want to go back that way. I don't want that temptation. The Bible says put no wicked thing before that. Why? Because God doesn't want you to be tempted above the E or able, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape. There's times, brothers and sisters Christ, where you put the temptation in front of you. You purposely put all this temptation in front of you, so when you fall, hey, it's not my fault. Yes, it is. God will not tempt you above that you are able. But there's times where you try to play God and you purposely put temptation in front of you. It's not the same thing. But if you're doing your best to serve God and abstain from all appearance of evil, God will not attempt you above that you are able, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape. Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. That's why when you go out there, you see all these 
pagan, every person that's lost that's walking around is a pagan idol, in a way. And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? Paul even likens them to idols. Remember, when, some, when I was lost, I was a false convert, but I was lost. When I was lost, I was a tool of Satan. I wasn't a good I wasn't a light for Jesus Christ. I was a tool of Satan. These people that are out there that are lost, our, our love for them is preaching the truth to them, preaching the gospel to them. But they're all tools of Satan until they get saved and born again. Until they give their life to Jesus Christ, they're gonna try to pull you away and hinder you as much as possible. Now, don't get me wrong, some of them, their intentions aren't that way, but that's just the way it is. Paul, and what agreement had the temple of God with idols? These people have given themselves to the world. They haven't gotten saved yet. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, is walking in you. Like I said, if you, when you truly understand the Godhead of the King James Bible, God the Father and the person of Jesus Christ, and how God deals with mankind through His body, Jesus Christ, and the Old Testament, Angel of the Lord, that man. I was just reading about Joshua. Not to go off on a, a, a little path to the side, but I was reading about Joshua when he came upon that cap, uh, of the host of the captain of heaven have I come. That man that's standing there, he, he comes up to him and says, Are you friend or foe? And he says, Neither of the host of the... Because God's not a respecter of persons. Of the host of the captain of heaven have I come. You know what Joshua does? He falls down and worships the man. Now everywhere in the Bible, when it's an angel, or a prophet, or like Paul was... When they tried to make him a god, and started to, or maybe it was Peter, Peter and John, when they tried to worship them and make them gods, they all sat there and said, don't worship me, worship God, only worship God. But here, the man that stood there didn't say nothing. I believe that was Jesus Christ. Of the host of the captain of, uh, host of heaven have I come. I'm the captain of the host of heaven. Jesus is our captain. He's our king, capital K, king. He's our capital L, Lord. But that's a little side note, but define, defending the Godhead. Okay, not the Trinity, not the pagan Trinity, but the Godhead. Right? Jesus was in the Old Testament. He gave up that incorruptible body and came in the likeness of sinful flesh. But it says here, God will walk in them. But what do you actually have in you? The Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will be with you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will be with you. And then in the next few verses, he talks about how God the Father sends the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to be with you. So if you have the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus Christ. If you have the Holy Spirit, you've got God the Father. See how that works? You're, you're a temple for the Holy Ghost. And you're supposed to be without blemish. And they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Once again, you're not supposed to go out of your way to avoid lost people. I know some ministries really push that. Avoid the lost world. Hide out in the middle of nowhere. Avoid the... You're not supposed to go out of your way to avoid the lost world. But when it comes to your walk with the Lord and living the life of Christ, you're going to have to be separate from this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. I know some men in ministry that over the years they've gotten very worldly. And now they love the world more than they love the Word of God. Their heartfelt desire should be their number one heartfelt desire is to please God. But instead it's to please the people around them and to please their flesh. Their heartfelt desire once used to be to do the will of God. But now their heartfelt desire is to do their own will, to live their dream life. Whether I've had brethren break up, uh, break fellowship with me over Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games, satanic style music, Christmas, get mad at me because I kick their lowercase g God about of off grid living. They want to live a certain way, but that's not the off grid living in itself is not a sin. It's when you put it above the the word of God and you put it up put it above the will of God. If God's like, I want you in a house church and I want you street witnessing. 
That's what you do. Yes, you have your dream life. I would always love, I always dreamed of living this way. However, I'm living how God wants me to live. What's going on right now? House, church, street, that's what God wants for me. Okay. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. We're supposed to be separate. We're supposed to be living for Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be about pleasing Him, doing His will. Some people, some brethren have lost their way. Some brethren have lost their way. They're becoming part of the falling away. Okay. They're not lost. They haven't lost their salvation. They've lost their way. They're no longer on that straight and narrow path. They got di distracted by the world and the flesh. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's why you get out there, brothers, says Christ. Verse 18, And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You get out there, brothers, says Christ, and you look at this world that's so wicked, ugh, you don't want to touch it. You don't want anything to do with it. I see that. I understand that. Okay. One of the reasons we're isolated in these last days is because these last days, it's gotten so wicked out there. We don't, you can't even, there was times, like I said, you go back a hundred years ago, you could go for a walk in the park, and for the most part, women were wearing modest dresses, long hair, the men were dressed modestly, okay? Um, men were acting like men, women were acting like women. But the language, how people talked, there wasn't sodomite jokes, there wasn't sexual jokes going on left and right, there wasn't loud satanic music blaring left and right. They weren't wearing clothing that was promoting sin and wickedness. You know, when they started getting into advertisement and whatnot. Sin and wickedness. You could actually go out and go for a walk. When you went to town to go shopping, you weren't vexed day in and day out. But in the last 50 to 100 years, it's gotten so bad out there. The moment you walk out there, ugh, I don't want this. And it's a good thing. So one of the reasons why we feel so isolated, brother says Christ, is that reason. Okay. But let's get back to Paul. Now, are we supposed to use that? Because some brethren will use that, misuse it, I'll say it. They misuse it as justification to also isolate themselves from brethren. Are we supposed to be isolating ourselves from each other? From the world? Be separate. Absolutely. Praise God, if God has helped you in your walk with the Lord, when your home is a Bible-believing, God-fearing home, and the world, you've been able to do without. I've given up a lot of things. I don't go to the movie theaters anymore. I don't go out to eat that much anymore. Brother and Christ, this isn't me just letting you know some of the sorrows I go through. There are times I remember my daughter, her coming to visit. That's not going to happen anymore. My daughter passed away. I've had family members that said, I'm not coming to visit anymore. I sit and eat dinner to a, a, I have a candle that melts over a bottle, and I set it there, and I light one candle and I have it lit when I'm eating during the winter. When it gets dark at six, and I, eat, and I come inside and I sit there and eat, um, I sit there to a candle light and it's just me. And I start getting lonely. Okay. Um, Brother says, Christ, I, I want you to know, you're not the only ones. Don't compromise. Please, do not compromise. These Babel buildings are not the answer. Don't compromise. What is the answer? Uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but house churches. I was talking to a brother in Christ online and telling him, hey, if it's be possible, if you have to travel, you need to try to, minimum once a month, if you have to travel two hours. One way, so four hours round trip, once a month, to get together with some brethren, to fellowship, sing a couple of hymns, do some fellowship, meet at a uh, mom, I call it a mom and Paul restaurant, where it still has some healthy food, but uh, meet somewhere. Come together, make it a big deal that you're trying to come together in true fellowship, face-to-face -face fellowship, to see how each other's doing, and pray for one another. Okay? We need to go out of our way to try to do things in these last days. It's going to be harder and harder, but what's the solution? House church. 
I say house church like a house, but the solution is, brothers and sisters of Christ, we still need to be coming together face to face. We need face to face fellowship, whether it's in the park. I have brother and sister in Christ in Belgium that they go to the park and they read the King James Bible among, with some other brothers and sisters in Christ and they read the gospel to the lost world. They're reading the Bible to, because it's predominantly Catholic over there, they're reading the King James Bible to some of the Catholics to let them know this is what God's Word actually says. You've been lied to. You've been deceived. But they come together. You can do it in the park. You can do it by the beach. i got a beach down here. All right. You can do it by the beach. You can do it by, in a park. You can meet together, and I told I know some restaurants that are mom Paul restaurants where you, there's places where you can sit in the back and it's quiet, and you can meet together, have fellowship. We need to get that face-to-face -face fellowship going again. The reason the body of Christ is in such a horrible state is everyone is isolating themselves. The Bible says, as iron sharpeneth iron, so is the countenance of one man sharpeneth the countenance of another. Paul said, you have us for an example to follow. You see each other. You're, you're, you're there. Paul was an example along with Timothy, Titus, Silas, was an example to the body of Christ. The Bible talks about exhorting the brethren. But now we think we can do all this stuff online. It all can be done online, that, and, and we can isolate ourselves. And it's hurting the body of Christ. What's Paul's attitude? Okay, let's get into Paul's attitude when it comes to fellowship. What was Paul's attitude? Was he okay with writing letters? Letters were it's just as good as regular face-to-face -face fellowship. Is that true? You don't need face-to-face -face fellowship. Okay, one of the verses that they try to grab, if I can get this back up, is um, one of the verses in Hebrews. I might even have it highlighted. One of the verses in Hebrews... They misuse the verse. Here it is. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. They try to say this. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Brothers and sisters Christ, that verse gets so misused with these battle buildings because they make it a commandment of God, like doctrinally, and they almost try to make it a salvation issue. You're not a good Christian if you don't go to a good New Testament local church. And that's nowhere in Scripture. I talked with that brother in Christ. We went through that whole chapter and the following chapter explaining how it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. This is directed to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. And fellowship's going to be so important back then. Why? Because if you fall then, you can lose your salvation. You take that mark and you worship the beast, you're lost. You lose your salvation. You can't get saved and lose your salvation then. Today, without face-to-face -face fellowship, what happens? Brethren start falling, becoming part of the falling away. They start getting back into the world. They start getting back into letting the flesh, feeding the flesh and letting the flesh be in charge. And the, but in that time of Jacob's trouble, that you let the flesh be in charge and you start getting back in the world, the number one thing of the world is you have to take the mark and worship the beast. You want that flesh fed, you have to have that mark and you have to worship the beast if you want to feed that flesh. You won't be able to buy and sell without the mark and worshiping the beast. So you fall on that day, you can lose your salvation. This verse has instruction in righteousness for us today. We can learn from it. Okay, we don't, I don't want to fall, brother, says Christ. I don't want you to fall. The Bible says we're to do all to stand. Put on the whole armor of God so you can do all to stand. The Bible says don't faint. Don't falter. We're supposed to be striving together. Not separately. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Not two. Not three. Not four. Not five million that you see out there. All these different denominations. We're supposed to be all one in Christ Jesus. What happens? We need face-to-face -face fellowship, and this needs to be our foundation, the Word of God. You have brethren that misuse that and say, because of that's not a doctrinally at us today, then therefore we can just separate and hide ourselves from the brethren. Uh, no, 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 no. We're supposed to still have face-to-face -face fellowship time and time again. John, 1st, 2nd John. 
And third John, talk about loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. I will love you as long as I'm here and you're way over there. Uh, then I can show you love. How do you show true love? We need to be there for one another. Physically, face to face, need to be there for one another. Can we be there for every Bible-believing, God-fearing man in one church of God? No. But you need to do your best to be there for the ones that are around you, that are near you. And if you don't have any, keep praying about it like I do. Keep your prayer life strong with the Lord like I do. God set the example. Pray with that. Why do you think God says pray without ceasing? You stop praying, you're going to start feeling so alone in this world. And you're going to start being tempted even more to compromise, go back to the world. Have a, you need to have a strong prayer life. Okay? So I understand that verse, because that's the number one verse I get from a lot of people. When I say, where are we commanded to go to a building, call that building a church, invite both saved and lost to it, where are we commanded to do that? Oh, we're commanded. They'll always run to Hebrews. They'll always run to Hebrews. I said, uh, that's written to Hebrews, and if you read the context of the chapter, it's talking about how you can lose your salvation. Talking about people that are righteous that can lose their salvation. People that are saved, they can lose their salvation. Can, is that, can we lose our salvation today? No, then it doesn't apply to us. It's not talking about us. It's talking about Jews and the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, let's rewind it to today. Let's deal with today, okay? Today is face-to-face -face fellowship. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, coming together in face-to-face -face fellowship. Is it important today? What was Paul's attitude towards it? 1 Corinthians 4.19, 1 Corinthians 4.19, this is 2 Corinthians, i got to go back to 1 Corinthians 4.19, now what we're going to do here, you're going to say all you're doing is just reading how Paul starts some of his letters and ends some of his letters, amen, yes, what's his attitude towards the brethren when it comes to face to face fellowship, you want to know, read Paul's letters, which is what we're doing right here. If you don't want to watch, if you're getting tired and you've already turned this video off by now, fine. Go read what we're reading here, how Paul starts his letters and ends his letters. Okay. 1 Corinthians 4.19. Sometimes in the middle of his letters. This is chapter 4, verse 19. But I will come to you shortly. No, 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 Paul, you just wrote him a good letter. That's all that's needed. You, you just wrote him a letter. That's all that's needed. And if Paul could, you, you, you did a video. That's all that's needed. But in his, his letter, where he's, he says, but I will come to you shortly. Now, right before it says, now some of you are puffed up as though I would not come unto you. Now, this had to do with correction, with, with 1 Corinthians. He's going to come to you, and he'll tell you what he's saying in the letter face to face. Why? Because it's important when it comes to correction that you take it to the, per the brother or sister in Christ that's going the wrong direction. You go talk to him face to face and confront him. That's true love for a brother or sister in Christ. Have all these men online that they show their, they, really, they actually show their hate for the brethren. They just kick them to the curb like they're nothing. They won't confront them. They won't talk to them. They won't try to get them back on the right path. They just kick them to the, to the curb. Oh, I did videos. That's good enough. No, it is not. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know, not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Remember I always say, be careful of people that talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They both need to line up. It's not just in words. Paul's going to come and show face to face that he means it. What he, what he wrote here in Corinthians. But his desire, I will come to you shortly. 2 Corinthians, jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 12, 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. Behold, you know the love that Paul had for the Corinthians, no matter even though they were very messed up in the flesh, they had false converts coming in, they had the world coming in, and Paul saying, Be not unequally yoked with the world. Today these Babel buildings, that's all they are. They're unequally yoked. They invite lost people and there's it's it's full of a lot of lost people. And the saved people that are in them are getting messed up by the lost people that are in them. The buildings look at them, they've conformed to the world. 
I was talking to a brother in Christ. I said, it used to be that you had a little piano. A good example, I watch Sheffy sometimes. They had that piano in there that when they were moving it, it was making that noise like a like an organ, but what it is is it had bags and everything and you would pump the bags with your feet and it would fill up the bags to put pressure and blow and you put the keys, almost like an organ, portable organ that was. They just had a piano. It was vocal. They had one little instrument that had to do with melody and it was vocal and they would worship the Lord that way. Where did the bass guitar come from? Where did the electric guitar come from? Where did all these huge speakers where you've got to blare the music so loud that everybody outside the building has to hear it? That's flesh. Why did they do that? Because lost people came in and said, this is what we want. And they conformed to the lost world. Who is influencing who? Okay. Despite the Corinthians, when they had the lost world coming in and messing them up, Paul still had such a love for him. Look at the love that Paul had for him. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. Oh, come on, Paul, you wrote letters. That's good enough, right? No, it isn't. And I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. Be careful of men and so-called full-time ministries that become very money-oriented. They're always trying to promote money. You can't live without me. Why we need this ministry? You desperately need me, and you desperately need my ministry. And they, they promote, they push money. They Remember the three tricks that they use? Uh, they bully you into donating. They guilt trip you into donating. They bribe you into donating. We talked about this before in the past. Those are the three greatest tricks that they use in the battle buildings, and they use them online with so-called ministries online, whether it's YouTube, um, some of the other platforms. They use these three things. They come very money-oriented. They don't seek you. They seek yours. Paul says, I haven't come to seek yours. If I don't get a dime, I don't get a dime. It's not about that. It's about absolute truth, and I care about you. It's about your walk with the Lord. For the lost world, it's about salvation. It's not about a paycheck. Okay. For children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Okay. But it says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. I seek not yours, but you. Paul had such a love for the brethren. Remember what it talks about where Paul cried night and day with tears because wolves in sheep's clothing, false converts were coming in? And what happens when you have false converts, worldly people, lost world, coming in and mingling with saved sinners? Who influences who every time? The lost world. You as a saved sinner don't pull the lost world to salvation. The lost world's going to pull you to doing things the way of the world. He's, the lost world's going to mess you up. And it's not about salvation. I said it wrong. You're not going to pull the lost world into doing what's right according to the Word of God, living right and doing right. The lost world's always going to pull you to doing the things their way. Look at the Babel building system. Do you want the example? Look at the Babel building system. I call them Babel building systems, but they call them church buildings. Look at how they do things today. Most of it, the, almost all their practices, for the most part, have no basis in Scripture. They have to grab from the Old Testament to justify it. But it has no basis in the New Testament. It has no basis in the Pauline epistles. We go throughout the whole body a Bible for instruction and righteousness, but they act like it's doctrine. If you want doctrine, you get it from the Pauline epistles. It might be mentioned again somewhere else where doctrine overlaps, but it better be mentioned in the Pauline epistles. Mm -hmm. But here we are, Paul's love from a third time. They're still having problems? Ah, kick him to the curb. That's one, uh, some of you know who I'm talking about. That's one man's solution. I, I called him a brother. I said I love you, but just kick him to the curb. Just kick him to the curb. And then treat him like they're lost, because it makes it easier on you. Just treat him like they're lost. That's my solution. Just kick him to the curb and treat him like, that's not Paul's solution. He came back a third time. I love you. What's Paul's desire? Face-to-face -face fellowship. Oh, come on, that's just then, that's just then. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 20, or, sorry, 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. So jump down to chapter tw uh, verse 20. 2 Corinthians doesn't have 20 chapters. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. Here it is again. For I fear, remember this is the third time, for I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not. Sometimes, you know what, you know what really hinders fellowship sometimes too among brethren? When you see a brother in Christ, let's say you had a house church, people were showing up. When someone stops showing up for a while, you don't want to know why they don't show up. They don't want you convicting them. They're doing something they're not supposed to. They're getting into the world. They're getting into worldliness. They don't want you convicting them. They don't. Remember Paul says that you'd see me as I would. A light. The Holy Spirit in me is going to convict the Holy Spirit that's in you. What you're doing is wrong. And Paul's like, I'm going to come and see you and find you as... I, let's see, I want to say it right. When I come, I shall not find you such as I would. Doing what's right. Standing together for this book. The word, I mean, back then it was the word of God. Standing for the word of God that Paul preached. Let, remember when he talks about once he comes, unless I find unto you envying, strife, debating, backbiting, whispering, chaos. But he talks about how he's going to come to him face to face. No, just write a letter. No, just write a letter. You already wrote a letter. And I'm going to keep driving that home. Because people think, for you brothers of Christ out there, this is to convict you. You think writing letters is good enough. You think making a few comments under some videos is good enough. It wasn't good enough for Paul. Brothers of Christ, if you have to go out of your way to be part of a house church, if you have to go out of your way, if that means even moving sometimes, like the worst case scenario, packing up and moving somewhere to be part of a house church, do it. It's worth it. I was talking to a brother in Christ. He said, if you had to give up a high-paying job where you had to work less for a low-paying job where you have to work more, but you get into an area where there's other brethren around and you're part of a house church and part of a street witnessing ministry, that's the way to go. It's worth the sacrifice. What did Paul say about charity? If I have not charity, I am nothing. There are men online that they have no charity. Zero charity. It's all about me, myself, and I for them. It's all about them living their way, doing things their way. They'll even pervert the scriptures to try to justify them living their way. That their will comes first. Their heartfelt desire isn't about God's will. It's about their will. What happened to charity? Charity, ultimately, when you sum it up, is self-sacrifice. If you have to sacrifice a lot of things to be part of a house church, it's worth it. If you have to sacrifice a lot of things to have fellowship with brother, face to face fellowship with brethren, it's worth it. It's worth it, brothers and sisters in Christ. I can't push it enough that it's so worth it. I don't know if I read verse 21. Unless when I come again, come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I will be well many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Come again face to face. When it comes to correction, you go to that brother and sister in Christ face to face. And you talk to them. Today we've lost a lot of, we don't have much courage anymore. And we hide behind uh, letters. I'm not saying she is, but I'm using this as, as, as a visual. She's, this sister in Christ is not hiding, but... We, all we want to do is letters. All we want to do is throw in our little two cents, our two cents worth in little comments underneath videos. Those are okay. You can make letters. You, Paul wrote letters. You can make comments. I'm not saying that's bad. But is that all you do? Was that all that Paul did? Oh, Paul just wrote letters. That's it. He, he had his own home, his own property, and he's living his dream life, and he just writes letters. He just does videos. Is that all Paul did? No. His heartfelt desire was to see the brethren face to face. Turn to Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. 
Are you trying to lead people? Like I said, when you go to correct someone, the Bible says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. When you go to lead someone to Christ, your, your job, if you're doing it right, is to tear them down so God can build them back up. That's the whole point about preaching against sin, to humble the man. We preach against sin. We preach on heaven and hell. We preach that Jesus is the only way. We preach what they did to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Why? To tear them down and humble them, to get them to stop trying to go about to establish their own righteousness and realize that they are no good. Why do we do that? Because we're just mean people? No. We do that to tear them down so God can build them back up. So God can save them. When they come to Him in a broken, humble state, saying, I am no good specifically. I did this. I did that. I did that. Not to me. To God. We confess our faults one to another. We don't confess our specific sins one to another. But when you come to God at the cross, you're throwing all your sins at the foot of the cross. Your iniquities. I didn't say you turn from them. I said you throw them. You're showing God this is how wicked I am. I'm no just saying I'm no good isn't enough. Why are you no good? Well, I, I I live like this and I do this and I just I'm just so wicked. I'm just so wicked. I deserve to go to hell. A lot of people don't get to that point. But the point is that for this, what we're talking about here, we tear people down so God can build them back up. How many people have talk like they're just wanting to utterly destroy people? They're not tearing them down so God can build them up. They want to see people get destroyed. They want to see people go to hell. That's their whole attitude. Be careful of that. It says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. We want to see people get saved. I want to see people get saved. When I correct brethren that I believe that are part of the falling away, I don't want to see them destroyed. And I'm going to mention a name. I don't want to see Brian Denlinger destroyed. I want to see him broken so he comes back and we get our brother in Christ back. The brother in Christ where this came first and I'm not going to correct this or change this to make myself look right. Where the ministry came first, not his dream life of off-grid living. And I could go on and on and on. I don't want the man destroyed. He's a brother in Christ. I want to see the man humbled so he can come back, so God can build him back up. I want my brother in Christ back. Not this worldly man that stands before me. I want my brother in Christ back. That's supposed to be our attitude, brother says Christ. Do you love the lost world? You preach the truth to them and we tear them down through preaching against sin, with, uh, talking about hell, heaven, what Jesus Christ went through because of sin. What they're going to go through if they can reject Jesus Christ? Hell. To tear them down so God can build them back up. Brothers in Christ, when you go to correct somebody, you do it in a way that you want to see him, God build them back up. You want to see him get back on the right path. That's love. But some brethren out there don't have love. They have hate. They have bitterness. And it shows. That shows big time. They're trying to destroy everybody. Anybody that goes against me, I'm just going to try to destroy them. That ain't love. Okay? That's bitterness. That's hate. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together. There we see it again. One spirit with one mind. Paul says elsewhere that we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment. When it comes to this book, when it comes to thus saith the Lord, we're all supposed to be on the same page. There is no agreeing to disagree. We're all supposed to be the same page, same mind. When it comes to worldly things, like people will hit me up, so I have to have the same favorite color. You know how they do that? They can't, they try to get away from this. They're always trying to get away from this. So I have to have my, my favorite food has to be the same favorite food as yours. Or my favorite color, that's world. We're not, we don't have to have the same color, favorite color, same favorite food. I'm saying when we say, thus saith the Lord, we all need to be in unison. Period. But that's not popular today. 
Oh, no, no, we don't have to be in unison when we say, Thus saith the Lord. We can agree to disagree. It's okay. Chapter and verse. They could pull that out, chapter and verse, to save their life. Paul, time and time again, same mind, same judgment. We're supposed to be one in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be striving together. You know, agreeing to disagree, That I, we did a big teaching on this. Agreeing to disagree is a, is a satanic teaching from Satan, and it's used to divide the body of Christ. You've got someone over here that believes this, thus saith the Lord over here, and someone says, no, 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 thus saith the Lord over here, and they get told, oh, you can come together, we can put aside our differences and come together. That never works, and it never will. You'll have two people that are button heads all the time. What's that going to cause? Friction. What's eventually going to happen? They go their separate ways. Every time. It might not happen in a day. It might take a couple years. I know, brethren, a couple years, then they went their separate ways. But it always ends in division. That teaching's not in the scriptures. Okay? But I might come and see you. What's Paul's desire here? To come and see them. But he says, if I don't, you guys still need to do what's right. Brothers in Christ, if you don't have face-to-face -face fellowship, it's harder, but you still need to strive doing what's right. And you know what helps you when you don't have that face-to-face -face fellowship? A strong, heartfelt desire to please God in the life that you're living, a Bible-believing, God-fearing home, your walk with the Lord, your desire to do the will of God, gospel tracting. Okay? Uh, the ministry of reconciliation. Read your Bibles. Prayer, that's another one of the will of God. God's will for you is to read this book and study this book, hide it in your heart, and live it. That word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. That's the will of God. Is that your will? And a prayer life. A strong, strong prayer life. Those three things, if you want power as a Christian in this dark and wicked world. Okay? A lot of people have forgotten that. But Paul's desire is to come and see them. Let's head over to 1 Thessalonians 2.18. 1 Thessalonians 2.18. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. There are times, brothers and Christ, where we desire for face-to-face -face fellowship, but something hinders us. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. So this wouldn't be the first time you come to him. It's saying Paul loves coming to these people and fellowshipping. But Satan hindered us. But Satan hindered us. There's times in this world where you're going to desire face-to-face -face fellowship and Satan's going to try to hinder you. But with Paul, he's talking about like prison. The weather, you know, might get in the way. Trying to travel. There's times where Paul had to rest during the winter in a spot for a while because it wasn't traveling weather. Storms. Snow, uh, you know, whatever. Satan hindered us. But you know what hinders the body of Christ today when it comes to face-to-face -to -face fellowship? The number one thing? You. This man right here. I'm not talking about me saying don't do I'm talking about the flesh. The flesh gets in the way. The world gets in the way. Now, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about you giving in to the world and thinking the world is more important than face-to-face -face fellowship. That pleasing your flesh, pleasing your wife, pleasing your husband, pleasing your children is more important than pleasing God. It's more important than face-to-face -face fellowship. That's what's hindering the body of Christ today predominantly from face-to-face -face fellowship. And you know what these people will do that don't want face-to-face -face fellowship? They'll grab what Paul says here and try to use that across the board. Oh, Satan's hindering us. They're lying. Satan's not hindering you. You are hindering you. You're letting your flesh hinder you. Your priorities are hindering you because your priorities aren't straight aren't right. God doesn't come first. His word's not coming first. Being a servant to the body of, to your brothers and sisters in Christ isn't coming second. Everything else is coming first and second. Those things are coming last. 
Okay, what Paul's talking about here is sometimes the world will hinder us. Hardships of the world will hinder us. God will open doors, but there's times where Satan tries to get in the way. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Satan will get in the way sometimes. Absolutely. Understand that as long as you're trying and it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. God will open doors elsewhere. Keep praying. Keep walking with the Lord. But my push here for this study is the number one reason why face-to-face -face fellowship among Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women who've said these Babel buildings are corrupt, these so-called church buildings are so corrupt, I want nothing to do with them, but I still want face-to-face -face fellowship. What's hindering you? Nine out of ten times it's you. You're hindering yourself. You're not willing to make the sacrifice. You're not willing to do what it takes. Be part of the fellowship face to face. Uh, Colossians 4 6. Turn to Colossians 4. But you see that his desire, though, when he says Satan hindered him, his desire there is still to see the Thessalonians, the saved sinners at Thessalonia. Face to face fellowship. Remember, he could have just written a letter, and he did. He did write a letter. But writing that letter wasn't good enough. Writing that letter wasn't good enough. All right. Next stop. Colossians. Colossians. His heartfelt desire. I don't know if we've hammered this through enough, but we're going to go hardcore. We're going to keep going. Let's go the backtrack to Colossians. We did Thessalonians. I started going the wrong direction. <laughs> I kept thinking we're going in order, but... I guess I didn't put it exactly in order. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace. Brothers and Christ, be careful of people that when they preach, it gets it's okay to raise your voice. Point there, point here, raise your voice. Sometimes I gotta raise my voice, so I'll listen. <laughs> you know? And you can get angry with the cause, but be careful of people who preach hardcore and it's always yelling. Seems like they're always mad and it's yelling. Okay. Talking loud because you're trying to reach a huge crowd, that's to me, you're yelling for a reason. But I'm talking about like behind the camera. The mic's right there. It picks up the volume. There's no justification to be jumping up and yelling, yelling, yelling. Okay. Be careful. Let your speech always be with grace. Remember, the whole point is to tear someone down so God can build them back up. If they're lost, it's salvation. If they're saved, they've strayed from that narrow path, from living a life of Christ, and you want to see them get back on that path. It's to build, let God build them back up. And you know why I say it that way, brothers and sisters? I can't build you back up. I can encourage you, I can exhort you, and I can encourage you to listen to God and let God build you back up. Bible says I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. Not through brothers and sisters in Christ. Not through that man behind the pulpit. Not through that man behind the camera. Through Christ. God can build you back up and put you back on the right path. I can only show you the way. Let your speech always be with grace. Like I said, be careful of those men. They've gotten very bitter, very hateful. Right? Seasoned with salt. There's the part where I'm talking about where you can raise your voice sometimes. You can be stern. You can have wisdom. Like, remember the difference between intellect. You can memorize scripture. That's intellect. Wisdom is when you apply it to your life and you've been living by him for years. Living by God's word for years. You've gained wisdom. Life application. Okay? Seasoned with salt. You have some people speak with authority. They've been through there. They've been there. Whatever they're teaching on, they've been there. They've made, if they're teaching that you shouldn't do something, they've probably made the same mistake more than once. They've been there. Seasoned with salt. That they may know how ye ought to answer every man. You can be stern. Absolutely. I'm not saying you have to talk softly all the time. I'm just saying when you see those men that it just seems like they're full of anger and bitterness and hate. They're yelling all the time. And their attitude just seems like they want to see those people destroyed, who they're talking to. They want to see you get destroyed. Not, they're not trying to tear you down to build you back up. So, I mean, so God can build you back up. 
They're not, they don't have grace. What happened to the grace? We keep going for good ways. I wanted to do this one for you. All my state shall Tychus declare unto you. He sent someone face to face to tell him. Okay. He could have wrote a letter. He could have wrote it all in a letter. Why didn't he write it all in a letter? He sent a brother in Christ to face to face fellowship with him and tell him how he's doing. Titus declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your state. Oh, come on, Paul. We can do this in letters. Paul's like, no, it needs to be done face to face. If we're hindered in worst case scenario, you're just writing letters. I'm not trying to make you feel like it's the end of the world. But if you're starting to get complacent where you're okay with letters, when God's trying to open doors where you can have face-to-face -face fellowship and you're slamming those doors shut in His face, you're wrong. Okay. I know a brother in Christ that could have had a house church 50 times over, but he's got one excuse after another, after another, after another, and after another. Why? Because the world's more important. He keeps, God opens doors, he slams them shut right in his face. And a faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. Comfort your hearts. You know, so I can read a letter and get comfort from a letter. Absolutely. I'm not saying you can't, Brother Christ. I can read a letter from a brother in Christ, and I can get comfort. It. There's times, Lord, uh, I talk to the Lord a lot. Brother says Christ. There's times where I get comforted in comments. I get exhortation from comments under videos. But you know the greatest comfort that a man, a brother or sister in Christ can get is when a brother or, sis, or, a brother or a sister in Christ travels to see you and comfort you face to face. Sit down with you and talk with you face to face. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. And you keep going and you keep going. We keep going. Christus, my fellow prisoners, salute you. Face to face, fellowship. And Marcus, sister, Marcus, sister's son, to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he have done, if he come unto you, receive him. If he come unto you, receive him. Face to face, fellowship is important. And notice it says if. Sometimes you get hindered. Absolutely. Sometimes Satan will hinder us. Sometimes God will say, that's just not what I want for you right now. The doors aren't there. But like I said, ultimately what's hindering us today is ourselves. We're not willing to make the sacrifices. We're not willing to go the extra mile to make face-to-face -face fellowship happen. Verse 11, And Jesus, which is called Justice, who is one of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort Unto me. Talk about all these people. Face to face fellowship. Erephus. Erephus. I can't pronounce that sometimes. Who is one of you. A servant of Christ. Salute you always. Laboring fervently for you in prayers. Prayer is important. It's always important. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Are you praying for brothers and sisters in Christ? I do a lot of praying. Do you brothers and sisters Christ? You can't always be there. You can't always be there face to face. We can't always have a face to face fellowship. So when you don't, are you praying for them? God's brought to my memory every so often. I pray about all the brethren I used to fellowship with, but they've turned from me for the world. Something in this world got in the way of our fellowship and they parted ways. I pray for all of them. I pray for Brian Denlinger. I don't just, I, I don't have hate for him. I don't have bitterness for him. I'm disappointed. He's hurt me. Absolutely. A wound. He's wounded me deeply. When you stab someone in the back, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a deep wound, it hurts. But I still pray for him. I miss my brother in Christ. I miss all my brothers in Christ. Especially the ones that have turned their back on me because he said so. I still pray for you. Do you still pray for me? You don't have to talk to me. If you, I'm not telling you you have to talk. Are you still praying for me? Thank you. 
Amen. Thank you. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hyperlis. Once again, brothers and Christ, men in ministry, be careful of those ministries that get so comfortable online, behind cameras, they get so comfortable with just me, myself, and I, a one-man show, and they they push separation. They don't have that heartfelt desire to actually be face-to-face -face fellowship with the brethren. Watch out for those people. And watch out for the fakers. Well, I do, I do. A lot of them that say, I would love to have face-to-face, -face, they could have it in a heartbeat. They're just full of excuses. They could have house churches in a heartbeat, but they're full of excuses. Be careful of the fakers, but watch out. What's their heartfelt desire? Do they want a face-to-face -face fellowship with you? They might not get to. It might not happen. But it's their heartfelt desire. I wish to be in front of the brethren. Brothers says Christ, I love preaching the Word of God. I love God's Word. But there's times where I get burnt out on the camera. I sit there and talk with the Lord and say, Oh, to be able to put together a study and just be able to preach it to brethren face-to-face. To have fellowship with brethren face to face. To preach to brethren face to face. A lot of us, some, a lot of us are getting so used to this. There's, I am guilty of this too. We get so used to this camera, we've forgotten that feeling, of, that desire of wanting face to face fellowship, face to face preaching. We're getting too comfortable with doing things the world's way. Now God can use the camera. He can use YouTube. He can use the internet. He uses letters. I've been comforted through letters. But God's way is ultimately He wants us to strive together. Fellowship. Face-to-face -face fellowship. What happened? We've lost that. We got away from the Babel buildings. Praise God. But now what do we do? We just sit here. We've become stagnant. What's the solution? We need to start coming together again. True fellowship. And there's some brethren out there that are doing it. Praise God. God's opened doors and you've gone through them. Praise God. Good work. Good job, brothers says Christ. They're doing that. Verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician and Demas, greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. The church that's in his house? You mean they're coming together in fellowship? Face-to-face -face fellowship? And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. How often, brother says Christ, do brethren come together just to hear the word of God read? Yeah, preaching, teaching, those are good. But how often do you just come together to listen to the word of God being read? I sit outside on the deck and listen to Alexander Scorby just read the word of God for hours. And I know a lot of brothers and sisters Christ do. But where is us coming together? And doing it. You're doing it on your own? Praise God, that's a good thing. But where are we coming together to hear it being read? A lot of times in these Babel buildings, what we used to say in these Babel buildings is they'd have one verse and then they'd have an hour of just babbling, just talking. Babble, 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 babble. And these Babel, that's why we call them Babel buildings. How often do you see someone up there just reading the Word of God? Okay, today I decided we're just going to read the Word of God together. Do you ever see that in these battle buildings? No. Someone's always got to give their two cents worth. There's not, don't get me wrong, when you're preaching and teaching, but teaching the Word of God, yes. But I'm just saying, have we lost that just coming together to hear the Word of God read? In the Old Testament, they'd go to the synagogues and listen to the, the law, the Levitical laws, the Word of God through Moses that he wrote down. They'd listen to the, the Exodus, uh, uh, Exodus is one of them, but um, the Torah, uh, Genesis, I've got the book up there. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, then you have the Levitical laws, the do's, the don'ts, how to serve God. They sit there and just listen to someone read it. Now you need teaching sometimes, but we need all of it. When you do too much of one and you start forsaking the other, it does hurt. It hurts the walk with the Lord. It hurts the body of Christ. When we start lapsing in one area. How do you come together and hear the word of God? Just to hear the word of God read. The brother and sister in Christ in, in uh, Belgium. Read the King James Bible publicly. 
So those, because uh, predominantly Catholic, they can realize, hey, this is what God's Word actually says. You've been lied to. You don't have to know Latin. You don't have to know Greek. You don't have to know um, Hebrew. You don't have to go through some guy to know what God's Word is. Here it is, right here. Here it is, right here. Let me just read it to you. And let your conscience convict you. Let God convict you. Well. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Arch Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. This is why Paul couldn't be with him. Satan's hindering him. But remember, he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ wanted him out, Jesus Christ would get him out. He's in bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. What's preventing Paul from being with him? He's in prison. There was only two things predominantly that prevented Paul from getting around. When he was sick, he talks about having a thorn in the flesh. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. When he was sick, or when he was under house arrest, he's in bonds. Okay, that's what hindered him. If it wasn't for those two things, he would be there face to face with the brethren. Mm -hmm. So, three things, real quick. Three things that hindered Paul from visiting in face to face fellowship Satan, sickness, and bonds. Remember those three things. We're not always going to, there's going to be things that get in the way. I'm not saying that if you don't fellowship, you're not saved. If you don't have face to face fellowship, you're not. Yes, you can be saved without face to face fellowship. Life's just going to be a lot harder. Your walk with the Lord is going to be a lot harder. Okay, we're supposed to have face-to-face -face fellowship. We're supposed to encourage one another. You know the number one time that brethren tend to fall away and tend to give in to the flesh, tend to give in to the world, when you're alone? You think nobody's watching. I mean, we all say that. I mean, come on, brothers and Christ. I'm trying to be honest with you. We all say, well, Jesus is watching. You know, God sees everything. But for some reason, we push that to the side. And if nobody else is watching... Oh boy, that's when we tend to give in. When we think none of the world is watching, like the lost world, so we're not losing our, te our testimony. Um, that none of the brethren are watching. That's when I see that brethren tend to fall the most. When there is no face-to-face -face fellowship and you think nobody's watching. Amen. Now my question to you, I wrote here in my notes, Paul, when he said he couldn't fellowship, Satan got in the way. It talks about him being sick. It talks about him being in bonds. Now my question to you, brothers and sisters, what's your excuse for not having face-to-face -face fellowship? And is it justified? Or is it just simply an excuse? It's justifying you not having it, but is it really worth it? Trying to say it in a way that makes sense. You have an excuse that you use to justify not face to face having face to face fellowship, but is it really justified? Is it your way of trying to get out of it? Your way of trying to avoid it? You don't want face to face fellowship. You don't want it. You're happy with pretending to be a Christian online, or you're happy with your worldliness. What's down here is more important than what's up there. And you're happy with your life down here. You don't need fellowship. So you have excuses. Or do you have actual justifications like Paul did? I want to be there, but Satan prevented me. He hindered me. I want to be there, but I'm sick. I want to be there, but I'm in these bonds. I'm under house arrest. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. 
verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. That love his appearing. Remember what I said before. Some of the brethren online, the reason their ministries are... They have no power in their ministries. You want to know one of the biggest re reasons for that is? They've turned their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. They no longer love the appearing of Jesus Christ. They'll lie. Well, I still love them. No, you don't. If you've put it off, you put it off. We don't know when he's coming back, but you seem to think you know everything. You've put it off. You're not looking present tense for that blessed hope. You're not living every day as if Jesus Christ could come back today. How is my walk with the Lord? How is my heart with the Lord? How is my the ministry that's God's ministry? It's not my ministry. It's God's ministry. How am I doing in the ministry that God has allowed me to be part of? How am I? How is my relationship with the brethren? How am I treating my brothers and sisters in Christ? How am I treating the lost world, the ministry of reconciliation, being a light for Jesus Christ? Are you rewarding evil with evil? Are you overcoming evil with good? When you think Jesus, when you believe, as I believe, which the, what the Bible teaches, that we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope, Jesus Christ can come back any day, how are you doing? You're always examining yourself. When you put Jesus off, oh, he's not coming for five or six years, you stop examining yourself. All your struggles that you use to keep the flesh in check, the flesh starts running rampant. Your priorities, when they used to be right, now they're all messed up. The world comes first. I gotta secure myself down here. I gotta endure to the end to be caught up. Because they have a profession. Some of them still have a profession that they believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble with words, but in deeds they deny it. They act like they're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. That love his appearing. They love his appearing by looking for his appearing and living every day as if he could come back today. That's someone who loves his appearing. Someone who puts it off. You don't put off something you love. You want, you, you want it now. You want that love now. How many of us want Jesus Christ to come back today? Is he going to come back today? But are we supposed to be living our life as if he is, as if he could come back today? Yeah, we're supposed to be living for the Lord always. We don't hit the pause button. And that's what some of these brethren have done, especially some of them in ministry. They've hit the pause button. They're not living for the Lord that much anymore. They're using this as a way to make money. Be careful. Be careful. Do Here it is. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. What? Paul's desiring someone to come unto him. For Demoth has forsaken me, having loved this present world. There's a guy, that's what we're seeing a lot today. Men in ministry, they start loving this present world. The brethren as a whole, the reason why we don't have much face-to-face -face fellowship is you're falling in the trap of loving this world more than fellowship with the brethren. Things of this world are more important. Having loved this, he's just, having loved this present world, Demas has forsaken me. I have, he's not fellowshipping with us anymore. He's not helping us do the work of the Lord anymore. He's doing his own thing. How many ministries fizzle out on YouTube? That's because that's not the platform God had designed for us. That's not what God wants for us. There's no such thing as full-time ministry on YouTube. I've never claimed to be full-time ministry. I'm putting out some Bible studies to encourage the brethren to keep standing. Keep living for Jesus Christ with all your heart, brothers, with your mind, with all your soul, spirit, and body. Living for Jesus Christ fully and completely. In these last days, brethren are falling away. They're not doing things God's way. This is no longer the, their foundation. This doesn't come first. Their heartfelt desire to please God is not there. They're too busy trying to please themselves, their wives, their children, their family, their neighbors, the world. They care more about the praise of the world than the praise of God, the praise of men. Their will, what they want, I want, I want, I want to live this way, I want this, I want... 
their will comes first, their heartfelt desire is no longer to do the will of the Lord, we're in the falling away. And I'm pushing so hard, to brethren, that I'm trying. I don't know if we'll be able to get back to doing things God's way fully and completely before the catching away. It might take the catching away to unite the body of Christ. That might be the only way. But are we supposed to use that as an excuse not to try today to be doing things God's way and get back to doing things God's way? No. No, we're not. Uh -huh. He left, having loved this present world. That's the number one thing we're seeing today. Oh, I love my life the way it is, but you have no fellowship. Face-to-face -face fellowship. You're not part of the ministry of reconciliation. You're not part of the ministry, period. Throwing money at somebody on YouTube is not being actually a part of that ministry. I'm sorry, that's, just, that's all deception. I donate money to brethren to help them out. Because they're hurting. Okay, I was deceived by that. Oh, you can have a full-time ministry online. I was deceived by that. No, you can't. Okay. Today we are... I'm going to go off on a little bit of a side note. Or a side path. I talk to lost people, and today... Nobody wants to do good jobs, real jobs. Nobody wants to do real jobs. Why? Because it's easier to make money on YouTube. It's easier to hide behind the computer and make money online than it is to go out in the real world and do the work. So much easier. It's more profitable. The young generation is spending more time uh, on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and trying to make money off that. Nobody wants to pump gas. Nobody wants to be electricians. Nobody wants to be plumbers. Nobody wants to be contractors, woodworkers. Nobody wants to do the work. That we're, and everyone I talk to, they're aged. They're 60 years old plus doing these jobs. Where's the young generation? Because it's more profitable. Less work and more profitable. Is this God's way? Can you do videos online? I do. I know other brethren that do. It's not wrong to do videos online, but full-time ministry? That's your whole ministry is just this? That's why I get burnt out, brothers. I get burnt out a lot on videos, having to set up the camera. And I wish I could preach to brothers and sisters of Christ face-to-face. -face. My heart's desire is to be with you face-to-face. -face. I'm out there sitting there praying for all my brothers in Christ, the ones that have forsaken me, having loved this present world. All of them, including the big man, you know, my mentor, having loved this present world. That's why he forsook me. Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Now, Luke isn't the only one in, in ministry. It's not just Paul and Luke. A lot of people misuse this verse and say, See, look, there's times where it gets so bad, it's just two people. No, he's saying only Luke is physically with him. He's got fellowship with Luke. He's the only one physically. He had to send someone over here to do the ministry. He had to send someone over here. It's just Luke with him. Then he says, Take Mark and bring him with thee. See, there's more men in the ministry. They're just spread out. Take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is profitable to me in the ministry. And Tychus have I sent to Ephesus. Well, we, some work needed to get done over here. I had to send a, a, a brother in Christ to help him out. The cloak I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. Especially the parchments. Okay. He's saying there's other men, but they're spread out. Brothers, this Christ, as we become fewer and fewer, we are going to be spread out. We're going to be, what they say, you ever heard that saying, spread thin? When you have a job that needs to get done, and it takes, the, and you have a certain time limit, and it takes a certain amount of people, and you only have half the people. And you're like, how am I ever going to get this done on time? Paul says we're running a race. Brothers, this Christ, we're running a race. And we have to run that race as if one receiveth the prize. And if you're looking every day for that blessed hope, and you believe that Jesus Christ could come back any day now, you're like, i got all this work to do. I don't know how I'm going to get it done, but I need to get busy. i got all this work to do for the Lord. But you got some brethren that are just, eh, he's not coming. Not yet. I'll just put it off. I'll just put it off.
Once again, 2 Timothy 4, 16, which we read already at first. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known. He didn't give up. Brothers of Christ, if you feel like you're the only one, don't give up. Brothers of Christ, I've been blacklisted. I, I joked with a brother in Christ. I've been blacklisted online. I've been blacklisted. A man who thinks he's the final authority and he strayed from the Word of God has blacklisted me. And I've got brethren who used to say, I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. They've turned on me. Am I going to stop preaching the Word of God? Am I going to stop preaching the Gospel? Am I going to stop preaching truth? Paul didn't. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that I may lay to a charge. Notwithstanding, I see. The Lord stood with me, strengthened me, that by my pre by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. And preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord brother says Christ, is your eyes on heaven? Is your heart dwelling on the judgment seat of Christ? The rewards in heaven. I'm going to have a lot of stuff burnt up. But I'm working hard so I have some stuff left over. Are you minding temporal things? Things that are temporary? This life? Things in this life that are just so important. And you're forsaking the things that are eternal. Your eyes aren't on Jesus Christ. He's eternal. This world is temporary. This wicked body of flesh is temporary. This life down here is a blink of an eye. I'm going through Psalms and how King David talks about this life is just a blink of an eye. It's nothing compared to eternity. Where are your, where's your eyes on? Is your eyes on the mirror? You know what I'm talking about. Is your eyes on this world? You got some men think they can do uh, uh, news ministry. There's no such thing as a Christian news ministry. Why? Because your eyes are not supposed to be on the world. All the fruits of these news ministries that I've seen that, that are supposed to be Christian news ministries, okay, they're distracting you. They're a distraction and it's fear mongering. That's the two fruits that you get. Oh, we need to start stocking up. We could be going through World War III. We need to stock up. Uh, what is that? Fear. We don't look at World War III and say, boy, boy, we need to get busy for the work of the Lord, and we need to start winning souls to Christ. We need to be preaching the Word. I need to be living better for Jesus Christ. He could call us home any day now. It could happen before the war starts. It could happen after the war starts. I need to get busy living for Jesus Christ. I never see that fruit. That's not the fruit of these so-called uh, worldly news ministries. They claim to be Christian news ministries. That's their fruit. Don't get me wrong, I look through the news, I, I tell people, I spend 5-10 minutes, maybe up to 30 minutes a day on news sometimes. But most of the time it's just 5-10 minutes. Just slowly thumb through the news titles, all you need is the titles, okay, this, oh, the world's still going worse, it's getting worse, oh Lord, this is going to be harder for us, but we got to get back to doing this, and we've got to stay strong for you, oh Lord. And I flip through it. I don't need to know everything that's going on in the world. They didn't know everything that was going on in the world a hundred years ago, and before that, for thousands of years, they didn't know everything that was going on in the world. They just needed this. They needed God's Word, and they needed to have faith in God, that He knows what He's doing. And like I've said before in other videos, we cannot fix this world. We cannot change this world. The direction it's going, God's allowing it to happen. So not only are you fighting against God, but you're not trusting God. We need to stay focused on the word, uh, uh, the word of God and doing the will of God in our own lives. Be careful not to get distracted. Deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Is that where you're focused on? Heavenly things. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Is that still your heartfelt desire to want to go home and be with Jesus Christ? As long as I'm here, I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to do my best to please God through His, His Word, His way, not the world's way, not my flesh's way. I'm going to do my best to please God His way. 
I'm going to do my best to do the will of God and not let my flesh deceive me into thinking my flesh's will is the same as God's will. God's will, what God's way, what He wants. As long as I'm down here, I'm going to do my best to please God, do His will, pray, stay in this book, read this book, hide it in my heart, live it. I'm going to keep looking for that blessed hope to the day I die. How many of you have been distracted? How many of you have fallen for some of these men that have fallen away that turned their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Brian Denley, or two years. This January, I think it'll be two years since he turned his back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of, his, of, of King James Video Ministries when he believed in the imminent return of Jesus Christ versus the fruit now that he doesn't believe in it. Look at the difference. There is a difference. Don't fall for the lies. Oh, there's no difference. There is. Where's your eyes? What are you looking at? What are you looking forward to? What are you living every day for? Is it for Jesus Christ? You know what helps us? Face-to-face -face fellowship. To remember these things. Yeah, we've got technology, camera, emails and whatnot, but we desperately need face-to-face -face fellowship. 19. Salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Anithius. 2. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. No, no, you can just write a letter. They don't have to come. They can just write a letter. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Because back then, when winter set in, it's hard to travel during the winter. Elubilus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Grace be with you. Amen. Brother Jesus Christ, I can't, like I said, Paul's whole heartfelt desire, and they'll try to hide, hide it from you, Brother Jesus Christ. They try to hide it from you. Paul's heartfelt desire is to face-to-face -face fellowship. Brother Jesus Christ, we're slowly losing that heartfelt desire. We're slowly losing it. Amen. I got a letter from a sister in Christ, and she writes, and this is when I did that study about the order of authority in the Bible. It's not talking about head coverings, like putting on a hat. I'm wearing this hat right now, Brother Jesus Christ, because it's cold. The sun is out, it's clear skies, it's going to heat up the house, so I'm trying to go without starting the wood stove, and I'll do it this evening when it gets cold again, because the sun's going to warm things up, and it's starting to warm up. That's why I'm wearing this hat. But it's not talking about physical coverings. It's not talking about this. It's talking about the order of authority. People always say, well, God can be the head covering of the woman. No, I've had a brother in Christ slip up and say that. No, you're wrong, brother. It's not what the Bible says. God is the head of the church when it comes to the cornerstone. Like I said, top, the foundation, Jesus is the foundation. He's the head. He's the corner of the church. But it's not saying Jesus, in that passage, it's not talking about Jesus being the head. It's talking about Jesus being the head covering. It adds the word covering. It's talking about order of authority. Jesus, man, woman, child. Right? That's the order of authority. And I had her, she wrote me a letter, and she said, Brother Philip, could you do a video explaining the scriptural way of a, god, of a godly man finding a godly woman to marry? The best way? House churches. Face-to-face -face fellowship. Why? Because you can get deceived online. I got deceived online. I failed the Lord. I failed the brethren. I failed the ministry. Okay? You guys all know about it. It's been years now. But I married a lost woman. She had a profession of faith. She was able to put on a show online saying, Hey, the, walk, the talk, the talk, 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 talk. But she didn't have the walk. And when God showed me that she didn't have the walk, I overlooked it. I made excuses for it. Well, I can help her. I can save her. I can, you know, we, we can get... You can't save nobody that want, doesn't want to be saved. You can't protect anybody that doesn't want protection. 
The internet is not the way, sister in Christ, and all the brothers and sisters of Christ, to find a godly woman, to find a godly man. The internet is not the way. You might meet someone on the internet, and then you start seeing them face to face for a year, and you see how they live their life, but that face to face is what's important. To actually physically see how they're living their life. Are they taking their words and putting them into practice? That's important. Also, how is a single, God-fearing, Bible-believing woman such as myself supposed to go about meeting a brother in Christ to marry? Now, here's my first advice to the sister in Christ. This goes for the sisters in Christ. This goes for the brothers in Christ. You're not supposed to be spending all your time looking for, for someone to marry. My first advice to you, sister in Christ, is do your best to live a life of Christ. To stay within the boundaries that God set me. Present tense, are you wearing a modest dress all the time? If the answer is no, you're not ready for marriage. But are you wearing a modest dress all the time? Do you have long hair? Do you have a meek and quiet spirit? Are you chaste? Now, she's talking like she has that heartfelt desire, which is good. That heartfelt desire to be a wife, to be a mother, to have a family. That's, a good, that's what women are supposed to have, that heartfelt desire. Now, God's the one that decides whether it happens or not. But you're supposed to have that heartfelt desire. But my question is, are you living now within the boundaries that God set for you? Are you working hard at being, practicing being a good keeper at home? The place where you live, is it clean? Is it taken care of? Are you learning how to cook good and healthy food? Sometimes in these last days and hardships, hard times, inexpensive food. I was talking to a brother in Christ online about uh, the poor man's soup. I see videos on sign that talks about poor man's this, poor, and it shows you how to make meals with three different types of food, and you make a huge meal, and it's got, and it's very inexpensive, and it's got all the vitamins and minerals that you need, that the body needs. Okay? Are you learning these things? Okay, are you doing your best to stay with that? That's where you need to focus. Now keep an eye open. There's a difference between looking out around you to see if God has brought a man into your life that fits, that fits the criteria. There's a difference between keeping your eyes open and then going out of your way to look like you're hunting. You're leaving that circle, that boundary where God has you, and you're leaving it to go hunting for a man. Okay, there's a difference. Yes, keep your eyes open. But how are you going to find a man? Like I said, the best way and the godly way to find a man to make sure that he's genuine, he's not a fake, he's not a fraud, is you've got to get back into the face-to-face -face fellowship. You've got to find some brethren, not just any group, but you've got to find some brethren to spend time with. And as that, as that house church grows, God, it's still up to God. God still might say, that's not for you. Marriage is not for you. You're to desire marriage as a woman, but he might say, hey, you're doing good. You have this body of Christ. Okay, you have elders, which is going to get into some further questions ahead of time. But you have elders in, the, in, this, in this house church that, you can, that can be your head covering. That they hold you accountable to the word of God. They can be there to help take care of you. Oh, yeah. Okay. As a father would a daughter. Absolutely. I do not have availability to me a godly father, brother, or other male relatives that can serve as a head covering for me until I am married. See, she's limiting herself. Brother, Sister in Christ, I know you. I've got your letters that you wrote to the ministries in the past. I love you, Sister in Christ, but right there you're limiting yourself. Okay. Like I said before, you, show, you get part of a house church. There are elderly men in the house church, and they can be like a father to you. And they say, hey, what you're doing there is wrong, what you're doing there is right, and they help you, according to the Word of God. They can be there to help you financially. They can be there to help take care of you. Like I said, the Bible way is so foreign today. The Bible way is so foreign today. You read in the Bible with Peter where they took men, there's women that were, um, their husbands had passed away, and they were being neglected. Nobody was taking care of them. And what did he do? Did he elect women to go take care of them? No. They elected men. Head coverings for him. Here's a head covering for you. These men will be responsible for taking care of you. The, the women that have no husbands, that have no head covering. Here's a head covering for you. 
We don't see that today. Today we try to limit ourselves, okay? You think marriage is the only way to have a head covering. It might seem that way, but like I said, we need to get back to doing things God's way. Where's the fellowship? Where's the house churches? Where's the house churches that have ordained elders? There's elders and there's ordained elders. Where's the ordained elders? Where are they? Okay. Where's the bishops? Where's the deacons? No, no, no. It's okay because it's profitable. It's okay to be a one-man show online and claim I'm full-time ministry and be a one-man show. Okay, it says, if you could also share counsel from the scriptures with regards to this type of situation, please do so. And we did. What was God, what was Paul's attitude? He wanted face-to-face -face fellowship. We're supposed to be coming together in fellowship. We're supposed to be able to see how our brothers and sisters in Christ are living so we can correct them, we can encourage them, exhort them, and rebuke them if necessary. As iron sharpeneth iron. So does the countenance of one man sharpen the countenance of another. We're supposed to be there to be an example to one another, to encourage one another to do what's right by this book. But more importantly, when it comes to this situation here, when it comes to marriage, so you can see that that man is actually a man of God. He's not putting on a show. He's not what I call an online Christian. He's only a Christian when it's time to type. But in his regular life, that man ain't saved. Or he might not even he might be saved, but he's not ready to be married. Like I said, I have all sisters in Christ. So I'd like to have a godly man, and I start hitting him up with the most simplest things. Do you wear a modest dress all the time? Well, no, that's just a choice. You're not ready to get married. Your pride and the feminism that you haven't let go of, you're not ready to get married. And that upsets some of these feminist women who like to claim to be Christians. And I believe, yeah, some of them might be saved, but they're having a hard time letting go of that feminism. I can wear pants. I can do whatever I mean. I have a career. I got my career. You're willing to give up your career. I've come across women that, oh, no, 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 my career is my career, and my home is my home, and my car. That's not how marriage works according to the Bible. You get married, it's his home. He's the one that provides for the home. You're a keeper at home. No, 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 i got to have all this. i got to have... You're not ready for marriage. Same thing with the men. I told a brother in Christ, that, I said, if you're still living with your parents, and you might have like a little part-time job where you get a little spending money to have fun, you're not ready for marriage. Do you have a job, a full-time job, where you have an income? Do you have a place ready to go, prepared, so when you get to having a wife, you have a home for her, to provide a home for her? You can provide food for her, clothing for her. But more importantly, that stuff is very important. But you know what's more important than that? Their walk with the Lord. If you're newly saved, I'll say this again, if you're newly saved, you're not ready for marriage. I know brethren that led someone to Christ and then married the woman right away. She wasn't ready for marriage. When you lead someone to Christ, they need to get busy working on, the Lord, on starting to live a life of Christ. They have a lot of sanctification to go on. Any woman that's newly saved, they've got feminism to shed, and they've got to start learning from the Bible the boundaries that God set for women. And the men, same thing. Okay, they need to start realizing that I need to be separate from the world. God's got a lot of work to do on them. They're not ready for marriage. But hopefully, Sister in Christ, I know this is not the easy answer. I know you probably, some people, I'm not saying she was, but some people are always looking for an easy answer. Maybe it's not the easy answer, but it's the right one. You want to know what your solution is? You want to find a good godly man? You need to start being a part of a house church. You need to start being a part of a face-to-face -face fellowship. And like I said, we're going to get into a study where we're going to show how to prove whether someone's in the faith. How to prove if someone's saved or not. Okay? You need to put the man to the test. Brothers in Christ, you need to put the woman to the test. You don't want to make the mistakes I have. Remember what I said earlier? We have men that preach hard because we've been there in wisdom. We've made those mistakes. I've made that mistake of marrying a lost woman that had a profession of faith. I was deceived. And I tried to help her. But you can't save someone who doesn't want to be saved. You can't protect someone who doesn't want to be protected. You can't force. I cannot force this on somebody that doesn't want it. 
So you better make sure that the person you're getting married to wants it, has it, and is living it. You better make sure. Okay. So the solution is house church. The solution is face-to-face -face fellowship. Making them prove themselves with the life that they're living. You won't find that online. Anybody, you can get so deceived online. This would help, and I trust would help other sisters in the Lord who may watch. Like I said, sisters in Christ, make sure you're doing your best to live within the boundaries, present tense. One of the exceptions I got is I, I tried to warn sisters in Christ with the brethren, and I tried to warn the brethren with the sisters in Christ. Beware of these words, these, these sets of words. I would like to do that. I would like to do that. I would like to live that way. I would like to do things that way. In other words, present tense, they're not doing it. Be careful of that. If they're not present tense doing it, they're not marriage worthy. They're not ready for marriage. For the, I keep bringing this up with sisters. I would like to wear modest dresses all the time. Are you present tense wearing a modest dress all the time? I would like to provide for my own. Brother in Christ, do you actually have a solid job and a, and a good home? Godly home? Prepared and ready to go? No. Then you're not ready for marriage. I would like to. I would like to. That's not it. Are you doing it? Be very careful. That's my warning to you guys. And the solution? Getting back to doing things God's way. We need to get back to face-to-face -to -face fellowship. We need to get back to coming together. To serve God, to worship God, to pray, to, uh, to go through God's Word together, and to hold each other accountable to God's Word. So when one of the strays, you help us get back on the right path. I pray you are well in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers, brother and sister Christ. Thank you, sister in Christ. In these last days, like I said, it seems like we have a lot more hate, anger, and bitterness towards one another than we do real love. We don't have real love for one another. Right. We just don't. The studies the Lord gives you to present has been a great blessing for my own spiritual growth. Amen. Praise God. She gave God the credit. The Lord gives you. Praise the Lord. The best encouragement I get from the brothers and sisters in Christ is through the scriptures. When you quote scriptures to me and you give God all the glory. There for a while, I, well, I was getting people patting me on the back and trying to lift me up, and I kept correcting him and saying, to give God the glory. And I was joking with the brother in Christ. It's like, give God the glory. And when I got on to him and said, you need to give God the glory, guess what? I never heard from him again. See, they wanted to worship me. They wanted to elevate me. And I know other men in ministry where they love that. They love being pat. They love that pat on the back. They love the praise of men. Give God the glory. Amen, sister in Christ. Thank you for giving God the glory. To God be the glory. My goal, my hope is that I can get you guys on this. That God is your foundation. To get you back on the right path. To get you living for Jesus Christ. To get your eyes back on Jesus Christ. This is with love in Christ, the sister in Christ. Okay? Now, this has been a long video. I apologize. I really, really do apologize, brother and sister Christ. But that's the solution. You want to find a good godly man? You want to find a good godly woman? We need to get back to face-to-face -to -face fellowship. We need to get back to doing things God's way. We need to get back to coming together. Whether it be house churches. I say house church. Uh, park church. Beach church. Uh, just like I said, if you have two or three brothers you know in Christ or sisters in Christ, you're willing to travel, I'm willing to, travel two hours to meet somewhere once a month where you can come together and spend two or three hours fellowshipping once a month. We have to be willing to have true charity, self-sacrifice to make this happen. Okay, today more than anything, we're spread out, I understand, but we need to try our best to make it happen. Hopefully this is an encouragement, brothers and Christ, not tearing you down to destroy you, but tearing us down saying, hey, we need to work harder to build this so God can build us back up and we can get back to doing things God's way. 
I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, I love you. Even the ones that have turned their back on me, I'm still praying for you. I'm praying for you all the time. I am. We need to come together. We need to be on the same page. And we need to strive together. We need to get back to face-to-face -to -face fellowship. That's the answer. Why, are you, uh, uh, why do you feel so alone in this world? And there's everybody all around you? Well, one of the reasons we talked about the flesh, how the world is, you're just, I really don't want that wickedness. We don't want to be around the wickedness. But one of the reasons is, is we're forsaking fellowship. When we can fellowship. If it's not there, it's not there. The doors are closed, the doors are closed. But the doors haven't closed. I'm looking more and more in it. The doors, God hasn't closed the doors. We are not going through the open doors that God opens for us. And some of us are slamming the door shut in God's face. We need to get back to a true fellowship, face-to-face -face fellowship. Okay? So grace and peace, I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. I'm going to be praying for you. Please keep praying for me, brothers and sisters in Christ. Even if you're one of those brothers and sisters in Christ, I had to break fellowship with you. Please, are you praying for me? Please, pray for one another. Show real love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Get away from ministries that are all about bitterness and hate and anger. And doing things my way. They promote the my way attitude. And they try to pervert the scriptures to make it out to be God's way when it's, they're just putting, pushing the my way attitude. Watch out for them. If you have to get away from them for a while, get away from them for a while. Get back to showing true love for brothers and sisters in Christ. So I'll say it again. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.